All right. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I know some more people might be entering, but I'd like to just take a moment to welcome everybody here tonight to the ninth uh, presentation of the HD Reaches 2022 Education Series. My name is Debbie Fox Davis, and I'm the Executive Director of HD Reach, and I'm thrilled to have everybody here right now. I just want to remind everyone that um, this presentation is being recorded and it will be available to watch later um, if you go to our website at hdreach.org. Um, and tonight I'd like to introduce our special guest speaker, who is Dr. Bonnie Hennig Trustman. Dr. Bonnie is well known to the HD community. She is on the board of HDO, which is the HD youth organization. And she's also works with many families through HD Reach and our genetic testing. Reporting in progress. Through our genetic through our gen testing program and through our, our counseling program. Uh, she is also known to many families in the Virginia area who might attend the uh, HD Carillion D Clinic. And um, I just want to let everybody know that if you have any questions for Dr. Bonnie, please feel free to put them in the chat. And she's going to answer those at the end of this presentation. And one last thing before I let her, let her get started, and that's lastly to thank all of our sponsors for making this webinar and our entire educational series free and available to everyone in the HD community. So I'd like to thank um, Genentech, Teva, Wave, PTC, Sage, Unicure, and Neurocren for their, their generous sponsorship. And now, Bonnie, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me, Debbie. And thank you to all of you to, uh, to spend your time with us for tonight. So my topic um, with the road ahead of texting and driving is talking to your family about getting HD treatment. And the agenda for tonight is going to be gathering information about HD, finding resources in your area, having open discussions with family members, what to do about family who avoid HD, and we'll spend a lot of time and a majority of the time on that, preparing for the future, and caring for yourself. When I say caring for yourself, my audience today, I'm assuming, is going to be people who are caregivers, people who are at risk, and people who might have symptoms themselves. So let's talk about a little bit about gathering information about Huntington's disease. I think it's really important if we're going to be talking to family about treatment is to educate ourselves. So one way to do that is through local and non-local healthcare providers. So when I say non-local, what I mean is I get calls and emails and texts from people from all over the world. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has lots of time to be able to do this from you know, wherever they are in the world. But our HD community is small. And you know, when you go to conferences and you see people from who are from all over the world, researchers and scientists, a lot of times they will say, just reach out to me if you have a specific question that I have expertise. So for my talking to kids about Huntington's disease, I've talked to people all over the world who just need a little bit of time of my time and my expertise doesn't mean that they're going to become patients of mine, doesn't mean I can prescribe medications to them, or I'm going to have them in my clinic. But I, people are willing to educate you and to spend some time with you. So I think it really is important to try to reach out to healthcare providers, whether they be local or non local. And if you don't get your answer from one, try somebody else. Also, there are tons of online resources, just like this conference. So the HD reach, and if we do not have the information here, we can certainly connect you to somebody who does. Other really good sources include HD Buzz, that wonderful um, resource of websites where people have uh, information that is very scientific and the people who are, um, uh, or are writing these um, different emails and uh, articles and, and different things in terms of HD Buzz really can explain things in layman's terms for, for all of us. And I think that that's a really good resource. Debbie mentioned HDO that I'm part of on the board of the um, Huntington's Disease Youth Organization. You don't have to be a young adult or have children, but I, sometimes having that information through HDO, even if you are an adult without any children in your home, uh, can be really helpful to go onto that uh, website, which is great. HDSA and other HD advocacy organizations such as Help for HD also have information. So the first thing in terms of talking to other people is really educating ourselves. Then finding other resources in your area. I think it is really important to look for support groups. 
whether that be, again, for someone who's a caregiver, for somebody who is, um, who is at risk, uh, for somebody who's just tested positive, somebody who's tested negative and wants to talk to other people, I think can be really helpful. And now, especially during COVID, we have options aside from being in person. You can go on to online uh, and, and, and go on to social media. There are tons of Facebook groups. People put support and information on TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter. There's all kinds of places that you might be able to find support from somebody. And obviously, conferences like this, whether it is in person or online, is a great way to really find out about what resources are in, air, in your area and having support. I think that that's a really good way to, to find out. So moving on to having open discussions with family members, I actually broke this down into three different types of sections as I thought about this. The first is telling extended family member about your choice to openly talk about HD. The second is talking to other family members about support, and I'll go into all of these in detail, and then broaching HD with a loved one who needs treatment. So the first is talking, uh, telling extended family members about your choice to openly talk about HD in your family. This has come up a number of times um, that in my, in my career of talking to people and, and treating people with Huntington's disease. Um, one that I'm specifically thinking about is a large family where there was one of the adults who said, you know, I'm openly talking to my children about Huntington's disease. She had siblings who were not as open. And she talked to her sibling, her siblings talked to her and said, please, you know, if my children come to you, I don't want you talking to them about Huntington's disease. And the woman, my patient said, well, that, that's fine. Um, you know, you, I, um, I will, um, you know, agree with your decision and I will, um, you know, hold your wishes that if your children come to me, I will say to them, um, you know, that please, uh, you can certainly, um, you know, go to your mother to talk to your mother or your father about Huntington's disease. But what she said is that I, my children are openly talking about this, and I want to let you know that they are putting things on social media because we've talked about this. They are talking about Huntington's disease on Instagram, on Snapchat, on TikTok, on their different groups that they have. And your children, their cousins, are, are part of that. So, you know, please know that I'm going to abide by your wishes, but I'm not going to say to my children, don't talk to your cousins about this or don't put something on social media. I can say to my children, you know, if your cousins ask you, please refer them back to their mom or to me. Um, but this is something that does come up because, again, we have social media and there are so many people who talk to each other and families or chosen families. So this is really important just to be able to talk to family members to say, you know, this is how I'm going to do this. So I think that that might be helpful for, for some people. The next is having open discussions and talking to other family members about support. This comes up a lot because there are sometimes people in families who say, if my brother or my sister just helped me with mom who has Huntington's disease, you know, it would be so much better. It would be so much easier for me. And they spend a lot of time and it takes a lot of brain space in their, in their minds to, because they're still so angry at a sibling who is, is not able, is not, is not there for them, is not as supportive as they would like. And this is something I talk to a lot of people about of, you know, maybe it would be helpful to identify other people because you're spending a lot of energy and time being upset and angry with your brother or your sister or another family member who just can't be there. And if you can let go of your expectations of others, you know, that might be helpful in identifying other people who can support you. And when I talk to family members in terms of this might be that person's coping mechanism that they have to be at arm's length, that they have to run away because they can't handle either them be, themselves being at risk or maybe they are symptomatic and having a lot of difficulty coming to terms with Huntington's disease or it might just be that they don't want to see their loved one progress through the stages of Huntington's disease and they just can't handle it. So this is their coping mechanism. So sometimes when I talk to families about really thinking about the expectations for everybody and your expectation might be different than somebody else's expectation. So when you openly discuss and say, what can you do? You know, can you pay a bill online? Can you help, um, you know, grocery shopping? You know, what is it that I can expect of you? And then delegating those roles. So again, it might not be somebody in your family. It might be your community. It might be a neighbor that you can say, you know, um, you, you said to me, if you ever need help, um, you know, call on me. 
And some people, you know, you can certainly say to that person, some people do just say that as a social nicety type of thing. But if you are serious about that, and again, if you're not, that's okay. But here's how I'm asking if you could help out. Could you sit with mom for a few minutes um, when I go and pick up my kids? Can you, when you go to the grocery store, um, you know, go and get me a few things on my list that I might need so I don't have to bring her or I don't have to leave her? So I think there might be some ways to think a little bit differently about this. And then, of course, broaching HD with a loved one who needs treatment. This is can be really, really dis difficult to do. And I'm going to spend a few, you know, definitely a bunch of slides on this. And we can have some discussions if people are having difficulty with this, because this is sort of the heart of this topic. And in terms of heart, you know, one of the things that I suggest is really having an open and heart to heart discussion with your loved one. And that should not be during a time of crisis. It should not be when there are behavioral issues or when there is a lot of stressors or friction in the family. But being able to sit down to say, I really need to talk to you about something that's been on my mind. And I know in the past you've want, not wanted to talk about this, but I just need you to listen to me. And sometimes that's just a way to start the conversation. The reason why it can be so difficult is this funny Latin term that I talk about a lot in some of the talks that I've given called anasignosia, which is a Latin term for lack of knowing. And when I explain this to people of why this is so difficult sometimes to talk to their loved ones about Huntington's disease, it's because with Huntington's disease, there can be a failure to recognize that there's behavioral issues in themselves, a failure to recognize cognitive decline, and the failure to recognize that they even have involuntary movements. And this can make it very difficult to reason with that person. So the way I explain anisognosia to people, because sometimes people say, how can they not know that they have involuntary movements when they're spilling things or they're falling or something is happening to them that you know they, they are you know, moody all the time or yelling all the time? And the way I explain it to people is, is if you've ever seen somebody who's intoxicated, this is kind of what it feels like. That's they don't know that their behavior is um, that they're uh, you know um, that they are irritable or that they are um, slurring their speech or that they think that they can drive and they can't or they think that they're walking a straight line when a policeman turn you know uh, pulls them over and know that they can do heel toe and and they can't but in their mind they are. So that's kind of what it feels like sometimes to have Huntington's disease. So sometimes just recognizing that people can have anisognosia gives it, um, it doesn't solve the problem, but it gives a reason why it can be so difficult to reason with people. So when that does happen, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but kind of the take home message is really going to be about setting limits and boundaries. And some of those, those terms that I, I think might be helpful is more communication is better than less communication. Open communication is better than silence, and honest communication is better than non-disclosure about, about you know, keeping things to themselves. And it really is going to, you're going to hear that sometimes you really need to wait until a situation gets worse for changes to happen, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So if you are in a situation that you have talked to your loved one and they say, fine, you know, I'm going to go in to see the, the, the healthcare team, a doctor with you, then it can be helpful to have some of these as tips. Don't remind the person with HG about the visit too early in advance. Maybe a day or two is okay. And you might want to think about being prepared with a backup plan. That would be having another family member or a friend go with you. What we do know sometimes are people who have irritability or they're really having difficulty, um, you know, you're, when you're having difficulty reasoning with them, is that a lot of times they will take those uh, those. Um, behaviors out on you, that mood will come up, that irritability and the and a lot of the anger and the outbursts will come directed towards you as the closest loved one, the caregiver sometimes. But sometimes when there's another person who comes in, whether it's a, a friend, a neighbor, another family member who might be an extended family member, a, an adult child, sometimes when they come into the picture, the person with HD really tries to hold it together. And we see that that happens a lot. So you're going to see that I do mention this a couple of times because that can be really helpful just to have that person as a buffer there. And know that certainly behavior and or sleep might change one or two days before the visit because that person's going to feel anxious. They're not going to sleep so well. And when we all don't sleep so well, sometimes we all get irritable. And that really, as we know, HD is like a big magnifying glass. So sometimes when they're, they're anxious about something or not sleeping, then the irritability gets even worse. 
in terms of, of reminding the person, you said that you would go in, and I think this is really helpful. There's a term that I call the, the SSDI or the SSI carrot. And sometimes it is about having that person come into the office just to say, you know, right now you're not working and we know that you're looking for a job, which might be realistic or not. But, you know, it might be helpful to at least talk to somebody in the HD program and the HD clinic so that they can help us to apply for this disability. And then once you get that, you can you can uh, go and look for a job. A lot of times, as we know, that that doesn't come to fruition in terms of them actually getting a job. But a lot of times I can get them through the door just based on disability and trying to help them apply for disability. And what I always tell people, if that person makes the appointment and refuses to go, just go to the appointment yourself. Just sit and talk to the team about what you can do, what kind of, of education you can, you can get, what kind of resources might be out there. You might learn about new research. And just to have a connection with somebody might be helpful. Another thing a lot of times that I do in our in our practice at Carillion is sometimes if the person refuses to come to us, then I can talk to that person's loved ones, the caregivers, about maybe there's a primary care physician in their community that they that the person with HD has a good connection with. And a lot of times with a release of information, of course, I can talk to that primary care doctor to say, hey, here's an idea, or have you tried this medication, or this is what we think is going on, or maybe these other medications that they're on are causing some of these problems with HD. So let's talk about how we can funnel things through you because a person with HD is willing to come to you. So there might be some ideas there. So if you do uh, and are lucky enough to be able to get in the door for treatment to the Huntington's disease program, wherever you are, my suggestion is right away, even if the admin person that is checking you in doesn't offer this, make sure that you get a release of information and you complete it as soon as possible. Of course, if there is an emergency situation, we are allowed to talk to somebody. Um, but again, an emergency situation might be somebody who feels homicidal or suicidal, or if there's something really emergent going on with the person with HD. But if it's some day-to-day -day stuff, you wanna have the ability to pick up the phone and talk to the Huntington's disease program. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but I think it's really important that you remember as soon as you go in, just as it's part of all the paperwork, oh, there's a release of information, let's sign this, let's get it off, you know, to the, back to the, um, the healthcare team, and that will, they'll have that in the, um, in the chart and ready for you. Sometimes I also hear that the person, um, the caregiver will say, you know, I don't want to say anything at the visit in front of my loved one with Huntington's disease because he or she is going to get mad if I say something at the visit. My response to that always is, sounds like she's or he, he or she is pretty mad anyway, and now is the time to break the cycle. If you are somebody who walks on eggshells to figure out what the mood is going to be, or if you say something, or you don't know how that person's going to wake up, or you know how that person's going to behave, then it doesn't help anyone to stay silent at the visit. I know these can be really difficult. And please do know, especially people who treat people with Huntington's disease, we know when we say to somebody, have you been irritable, or are there any problems, or you know, are you... Um, uh, are you cranky at times? You have temper outbursts and they say no. When we look at that caregiver in the corner who's just like shaking his or her head to say, you know, this is awful. Um, that's really the time that we do need you to step up to the plate to say, well, that might be my loved one's, you know, perception of what's going on at home. But, you know, for us, it can be really difficult at times. And there are times that he or she is irritable and, and we need to talk about that. So that opens this up. Then after the visit, sometimes there is what I call the dreaded ride home. And the only reason I'm telling you about this is, 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 to, is to prepare you. So it could be that that, and this happens a lot. Um, and I just saw a family, a, a husband and a wife. And, you know, she said, this is exactly what happened. You know, that they were in the clinic. She was honest with us. He was starting to get a little irritable and that dreaded ride home that first she got the silent treatment and then he started yelling at her. 
Again, some of the tips in order to try to minimize that a bit would be to have another person with you. Sometimes what we find is like just giving that person with HD a little bit of time, they don't um, hold a grudge. Or somebody will say to me they were irritable and they were yelling. And then the next morning it was like nothing happened, which can be really common. So sometimes giving a little bit of that buffer um, can be really helpful so that the person not so much forgets, but the emotion gets toned down a, a quite a bit. Certainly another tip is don't get into a screaming argument. Don't start to yell back at the person. Just, you know, I'm sorry you're upset. I need to focus on driving and we'll get home. And if you want to, we can have a discussion about that. I am going to put this point on in because it has happened uh, to people that I've been uh, treating over the years, is I really do want to make sure that when you are in a car with somebody who has Huntington's disease, and if they tend to get irritable, please do make sure that you have childproof door locks on your car. Um, I have been in situations where people have tried to open up doors when their caregiver was driving. Um, and I've been in situations where we have had another person in the car with the, the, um, the person who has Huntington's disease and they were in the back seat. And because they did have, because we suggested that they make sure that the childproof locks were on, that that um, avoided a really bad situation. Thankfully, the adult child was in the back. The door um, childproof door locks were, was on they were on. And, you know, it was a little bit of a difficult situation going home, but everyone was safe going home. And I also really, really suggest to you to have what I call healthy respite at waiting at home. So if you go into, uh, into a office visit and it's this stressful and the person's you know yelling at you on the way home and then you've got to get in the house and start making dinner and attending to children, that can be a lot. But if you think ahead of time and you plan ahead of time to say, all right, you know, maybe someone's going to take that person with HD out to a quick bite for fast food. Maybe I can just drop everyone off and you know drive around on the block and read a book for a few minutes, but you need to decompress because if you're wound up and you are overwhelmed and you're walking to a house where everyone needs you after a very difficult um, clinic visit like this, it's not going to be helpful for you. So we need to make sure that there's some healthy respite for you at home. So in terms of post-visit, a lot of times I will get feedback that the person will say, you know, why did you tell on me? Why did you tell the HD, HD team all that about me? And really what I try to do with educating caregivers is saying, talking to healthcare providers is not tattling on the person with HD. So first we have to get you as a caregiver into a mindset that you did not do anything wrong. And then giving you tools to be able to say to your loved one, it's really important that I tell them what's really happening so that they can help us. Because right now at home, this is not working. Everyone's walking on eggshells. There's a lot of yelling back and forth going on, and we need to figure out a way to do this better. The other thing that can happen at home is that sometimes people will say, if you don't calm down, I'm going to call the HD team. And that's a thread back to the person who has symptoms. So it really can be very helpful just to say to the person, it seems like you're having a short fuse or you're having some temper problems. Now is a good time for us to contact the team. And I do this in my office a lot of times, even when there's not a, 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 a problem right then and there, not a crisis right then and there. If I hear that sometimes a person can be a bit stubborn or a bit irritable or have temper tantrums or some kind of abusive uh, you know, situation, what I say is this is not going to be a, um, a situation where you're going to say, if you don't calm down, again, that would be a threat. But if that situation arises, and we'll talk a little bit about calling 911, but if the situation arises that you're going to say, I can do this alone, or I can do this with you, as we talked about with Dr. Bonnie or whoever your, your healthcare providers are in their programs, as we talked about, I need to call them when you're out of control here. I need to go out and I need to call. If you want to be there to say how you feel, that's fine, but I'm going to be doing this. So it's not a threat at all. So another thing that does happen, unfortunately, and sometimes this is, again, with or without the release of information, sometimes I do get families who will say, don't tell my loved one, don't tell the person with HD I call, but this is what's going on. 
And it's very hard because then I'm limited with this information. So if the person comes into my clinic and I say, are you irritable? Because the, the, the loved one, the caregiver called and said, they're really irritable lately. And if the person says, no, I'm not irritable, and the caregiver is sitting behind them and doesn't say anything out loud, I can't say, well, I don't think that's true, or you know, something's el- is something else going on. It, it is, I need that person, that caregiver to step up to the plate a little bit. Um, you know, certainly you can give me a heads up to say, this is something I need you to bring up, but I will say to that caregiver, I need you to, you know, admit that when I say, are you irritable? And that person says no, that you say, "Mm, that's not always the case. So again, let your loved one know in advance that the plan is to contact the HD program if there are behavioral issues. So you've talked about that before there is a crisis going on. And also, it's really important to have a safety plan in place and follow through with that. So let's talk a little bit about the safety plan in place. It can be really helpful in your area to contact local law enforcement to educate them about HD and to inform them that you have a loved one with Huntington's disease at home. So there are people who um, go into their local police department and, you know, will connect with the um, crisis intervention people or the mental health professional there and will bring brochures or say, you know, I want to educate somebody or a whole bunch of people here about Huntington's disease. And just so you know, I have a loved one. So if I call and we'll talk a little bit about this, if I call somebody there will be educated. In terms of a safety plan, I want you to also make sure that you keep a cell phone charged at all times. Get into the routine of making sure your cell phone is charged to full and that you always have it on you. Also, it can be really helpful to have a file on your phone someplace in notes or uploaded someplace or something that you print out and take a picture of even of the entire medical team of their phone number and maybe even a hospital or an address where they're located, as well as a list of medication, the doses of the medication, when people take the medication and what that medication is for, your understanding. That can be something that you talk to your healthcare team about as well. I wanna write down my medication or my loved one's medication and all the reasons that they take that. So these can be really helpful in terms of a safety plan. And now let's talk about when there are issues in terms of that behavior and those threats. If that person is a threat to themselves, meaning that they've fallen, because I do get a lot of people who will say, um, well, they fell and, you know, I didn't call 911 and it seemed to be okay, or, you know, uh, maybe there's some bruising. That fall could be that change of life situation. So even though you might have been able to get that person up, a lot of times when people refuse to come into the uh, to the program, that fall, even if it's not doesn't look like it's life threatening, can be the way to call 911 and get a person medical care. So I want you to think about that and keep that in the back of your mind. So threats to self can be falls, you know, that are accidents or self-harm if that person is saying, you know, I want to harm myself or you are concerned about that person harming themselves or they have a plan. Then there's a threat to others. So certainly any kind of verbal threats, uh, physical, whether that's you being a caregiver, other people, or even to the environment that they are setting fires or they're vandalizing or they're doing something. Also, it can be sexual threats. So if the if you are threatened, if that person is a threat to themselves, the first thing is to get somewhere safe. Have your cell phone on you and get someplace safe. And then the second part is to call 911. And we'll talk a little bit about that now. So this This slide is to prepare you. It is not to scare you, but I have worked with so many people who have had to call 911, and I want to let you know that you do need to prepare yourself emotionally. There's a lot of feelings of guilt about this. There's a lot of feelings of, you know, it's not bad enough, or I should be able to handle this. So I think it is really important to know that those are normal feelings, but that that might be, again, the change that things have to get worse before they get better. So let's say you are somebody who went to your local law enforcement and educated them and they said, great, when we get the call, you can identify the person and say, you know, we need somebody out here. It might just be that day that nobody used to talk to came, you know, was on call that day or was working that day. So when the dispatcher called and sent a police officer over that that person wasn't educated about um, working with people who might be cognitively impaired, working with people who have neurodegenerative diseases, 
And that police officer thinks, okay, I need to protect myself. And then my job is to protect other people as well. So I want to let you know that sometimes this can be traumatic. And again, this is not to scare you. It's to prepare you that there have been people who have been taken out in handcuffs or the, you know, the, the, the plastic handcuffs or because they're belligerent and that police officer doesn't know if they're going to attack them, that they have been put on the floor and put in handcuffs. So I want to let you know that this can happen. You can do everything you can to prepare yourself. And I'm not saying you shouldn't call 911 if there is a threat, you need to call 911. But I want you to emotionally prepare yourself and please do make sure you have children out of the house, not to send them to the room because they're going to hear what's going on. They're going to see what's going on. It is really important if you, if time allows to make sure if that person is a threat that you get the children out of the house. So talk to your neighbors, let them know if there's an emergency situation, they're on speed dial um, and that you do need to, you know, certainly you're going to try to calm down that person as much as you can. But if this is a true threat, uh, threat you need to call 911. And again, in terms of guilt, this is very, very common. My When I talk to people who feel guilty, I never say, don't feel guilty. That's your emotion and, and you need to hold on to that emotion. So I can't take your guilt away, but what I can say to you is that it's typical, it's normal, but let's try to refrain, frame this, that this might be the only way that you can get help. Because if you don't call out for help, if you're not in this situation and you try to fix it each time or pick the person up or dust them off or just try to keep everything calm, this is going to continually happen over and over. So sometimes making that call just to get the ball rolling, it might be that a police officer comes out and the person is calm and they say, I can't do anything. That's fine because now a little bit of a paper trail is starting. So again, it might need to get worse before it gets better. Again, I'm preparing you. My plan is not to scare you. So let's talk a little bit about the future and preparing for the future. It can be really helpful to teach family and friends about HD so they know to expect that there might be some of these behaviors, especially in people who are avoiding treatment. You do want to try to keep your routines and daily schedules. People do better when they know what to expect. Obviously, as we, I went over, is to create a good working relationship with the HD team. And also you wanna think about finances and driving before it's ever an issue. So let's break that down a little bit. In terms of finances, what we know is that sometimes it becomes really difficult cognitively for people to manage their own finances. Either they can't pay their bills on time or they're not paying their bills at all or they're overspending or they are mismanaging money in another way. So I think it's really important as early as possible when you can talk about this to, to try to get a power of attorney, a POA. That could be for healthcare reasons so that you're able to make, and this is a durable power of attorney, um, which means that a person, if they're incapacitated, incapacitated, they can't revoke this, they can't take it away. Talk to, you can do this online. You can get a power of attorney and have a notary sign this. You can certainly go to an attorney. You can, um, you know, to talk to uh, people who who do this, you know, for a living uh, in terms of a specialist who who takes care of planning for estates and things like that. So it would be for healthcare decision making of of their own healthcare. It could be financial that you would be able to um, manage bank accounts or um, be able to manage bills and contact a bank and say this is you know a change or this is something I need. And it can be for personal decisions, such as aside from healthcare, such as voting, such as taking care of children or something like that. So I think that that's important. Um, I think for finances, it could be in, you know very helpful for some people to limit access to the internet. I do have a lot of people who go on to the internet and just spend frivolously. Um, and you can also limit access to funds. Again, with the power of attorney, you can certainly talk to a bank and say, I want to give them a, a card that I put $20 on, or I want them to not have a credit card. So that can help to access, to limit the access to funds, which will then help with the, the regulation of the spending. Um, and remember, yes, I do know that people can get angry about this. So we try to, again, prepare for the future when a person is able to or, you know, if there's a situation where it's past that, then maybe it will have to be talking to um, 
going to a, a court, a probate court, and applying for conservatorship, which can be really difficult. And if for anybody, we can touch base on that if needed. Um, also driving. It can be really important to alert law enforcement that you do have somebody who has Huntington's disease who is driving. Um, also, when and you know, driving is important to me. I, I've, I've done a lot of work on working with people who have dementia and driving. And what I always say, you know, is that I've worked with people who have Huntington's disease and their families for over 25 years. I feel like I'm, I have some expertise in Huntington's disease. I am not an expert on driving. So I never say to families, it's your job to take away keys. I never take away keys. What I say is, and when I assess a person in my clinic, uh, or if I do a brief cognitive exam on them, or send them for in-depth cognitive exa examination, that the information I get back will tell me if there are certain um, cognitive abilities that they have that correlate with driving. So a lot of these tests that we give in the clinic do correlate with ability to drive. So if I see that there's a deficit there, it tells me that it's time for me to contact Department of Motor Vehicle and do and ask for a medical review on the person. So you can certainly, this might be one of those calls with the, with the release of information to say, I'm really concerned about my loved ones driving. And, you know, I know it's not my job to take away their keys. And I know, you know, that I don't have the ability as a healthcare provider, but DMV does. So it might be that I say, okay, I will give the person a brief cognitive exam, see how they do and say, you know what, this was part of our regular assessment for you, but there seems to be some issues here. And because of this, I'm going to be contacting the department motor vehicle and asking for a medical review. Oh, you're angry at me? Okay, you can be angry at me. That, that's part of my job. Oh, you think that you're going to be fine? That's great. Then you'll be able to do the on-road driving test. And if you pass, we're fine for you know six months, a year, whatever it is. So um, again, that can be really helpful in terms of preparing for the future. And my last few slides before we open this up for questions is really about caring for yourself as a caregiver. The This talk was really about um, getting care for the person with Huntington's disease. But we do know that research tells us that if you're as a caregiver, not caring for yourself, not able to take care of yourself and are kind of going down with the ship, that that person with HD is not going to do well either. So it's really important that you think about the care for yourself because we know that caregivers are people who need to be taken care of as well. We know that caregiver burden can lead, and this is all research, to psychological stress, depression in yourself, anxiety, can affect your immune system, which means that you get sick, sicker often, and increase blood pressure. And what you're doing as a caregiver is a very hard job to do, especially when that person with HD is negative, self-centered, or abusive. So it's really very important as a caregiver that you need to find a place to recharge your battery and to get some respite. Again, we talked at the beginning about finding a good support people, uh, either a group and or a therapist, and joining a caregiver support group if you can, even if it's online once in a while. And again, if you are going to a support group or log on to a group and you're saying, this is just not jiving for me, that's fine. Go find another one. You're going to find that right fit or that right person who you can talk to, which is going to make it a little bit easier. It's not a magic wand. We can't take away the stressors. But just knowing that there's somebody out there who feels the same way or similar that you do can really be very, very helpful. And here's some tips that I've used in other talks, even through HG Reach, about caring for yourself. It is so important to take, even if it's a little personal time, to care for yourself. For some, they just meditate, and that could be five, 10 minutes. There's apps, whether it's yoga or meditation of calm, just to be able to check out for a few minutes and say, I'm just checking in with myself. For some, they've said to me, I go and read a book. Or as I said, they take a yoga class, and it doesn't have to be an in-person. It could be a free app going for a walk, getting out in nature, making sure that you get enough sleep. This is so important. I talk to so many caregivers who are just not sleeping well. And when that happens, you're not going to be able to take care of yourself. And therefore, you're not going to be able to take care of that person with HD. Make sure that you do try to eat healthy food and drink plenty of water yourself. Take care of yourself. And please do make sure that you have regular checkups. I talk to so many caregivers and I say, have you gone in for your checkups? You know, you're focused on this loved one with Huntington's disease, but are you following up? 
I know for so many people, they're like, I'm just putting it off. I'm just putting it off. Or I don't want to go to a doctor. I don't want them to find anything. But think about if there's something going on with you that you could get better, that you could catch early. That's really important because if you are sick, if you are chronically ill, you're not going to be able to take care of that person with HD either. So again, Debbie had mentioned some of our sponsors, and I do want to thank them again for this. And we will open this up um, you know, to make sure if there is anybody who has any questions or concerns, um, please do let us know so that we can answer some of your questions. And again, I do hope this was just a smattering, and I covered a lot in about 40 so minutes. So this was just a smattering to try to get some of these conversations going. So if anyone does have any questions or concerns, please do uh, let us know. I have a question. Please. Okay. Um, I, I, this seminar has been awesome. Um, I've, I've learned a lot and I've attempted to do a lot of the things that you've suggested. Um, and um, my uh, husband will not um, go see a healthcare provider. And um, I'm at a point where um, I'm concerned about uh, spending and um, looking into maybe a conservatorship mm -hmm. and, but I don't have a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm good. I'm actually meeting on Friday with a lawyer um, to discuss options. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. Will your um, loved one with HD, with loved one who, you know, you're assuming it has an HD, will they see any healthcare provider, not just somebody in HD expert? No. No, will well, not. Okay, all right. Not, not in over three years. Okay. okay. All right. So a lot of times, and, and um, depending on which state you are, and, you know, again, this is being recorded, so you might not want to, to say that out loud, but depending on which state, um, it sounds like you're already going to be seeing an attorney, you know, which is fine. What I sometimes do say to people is it might be helpful to talk to probate court. And again, in this situation, your attorney should be able to let you know what the laws in your state are um, in terms of probate. Getting conservatorship can be a little on the difficult side um, because that is only um, something that a judge is going to grant. And sometimes a judge, it's not that they're trying to be mean. It's that sometimes they're going to say, if I take away this person's rights, I'm taking away all of their rights. And it might be that they're making bad decisions, that this person with HD is making bad decisions. But, you know, are we at a point that they are um, a harm to themselves or to others? And you might say to, you know, this attorney, well, you know, if you're concerned about finances and that your loved one is um, spending all of your money, you know, th that could be, you know, a serious situation. Um, you know, would they be willing to do a power of attorney at all? Would your or your husband? I, I have, be? I have that. I have, have that, a power of attorney. I do, but I don't know if if I can. I, I guess I need to speak with a lawyer and figure that out. Yeah. If I can use that. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not. And I want to make a caveat that I'm not. I, I don't provide legal counsel, but I have heard people in this situation. If you do have a power of attorney, one mm -hmm. of the things you might be able to do is to go to the bank and say, "We need to figure out a way to sort of cut him off." Like I mentioned, and the reason this is on a, a seminar like this is because you're not alone. This has happened to multiple people. So, in a situation I thought about many years ago, the person you know was not. Uh, able to be conserved. You know, the, the, the courts did not feel, they felt that they were making bad decisions, but not to a point that they were harming themselves. But the family did need to go to the bank and say, we need to work together. Here's the power of attorney. Uh, we need to work together to make sure that, um, you know, we're, that my loved one is not going to spend all of our money. And it was really just not as simple as that, but really having a good relationship with the bank to say, how can I cut all this up? You know, can I, I need to contact all the, the credit card companies and cut that off. Um, and, you know, the other part is, you know, my loved one is going to be so mad at me. Yeah, but, you know, it's going to be risk and benefit, if that makes sense. It's going to be like, you know what, there's an issue here. You're not willing to go in and get some help. 
um, you know, there's overspending here and this is what we need to do. So it is going to be a little bit about those that setting limits and, and the boundaries and being able to say, OK, is this a, con a, con a conservatorship um, uh, issue or is this me taking that power of attorney and going to all those places to say, I have a power of attorney. My loved one is, you know, not, is not willing to get medical care and, um, you know, that they are there's a family history of Huntington's disease. I mean, the cat, you should the cat should be out of the bag at this point. And, you know, and I need to step in and, and cut them off. So that's a survival thing. And unfortunately, like I said, your story is unique, but unfortunately, it's not something I haven't heard multiple times over. Does, that, sure. does yes. that answer some of those questions or at least give you something to think about? Yes. And what is what is the what is a probate court? What does that mean? Okay, so there's different types of courts. So like a family court might um, be for people who are, um, you know, that there are family issues, a civil court, you know, if, if there's criminals, probate would do things like conservatorships, like wills, um, things that um, uh, if you have in your area, and if you just Google probate court in my area, that mm -hmm. will be the type of court that you need, that would be the judge who would hear a conservator case. They also hear when someone dies wills, they hear, you know, a lot of, of different estate kind of planning types of things. So that would be that type of court. Um, but if you put in probate court and your town and your state, um, you should be able to get a local um, court. And a lot of times you can either talk to a clerk or just go into the probate office and say, I need a, a little bit of time, you know, your time. One of the issues with conservatorship is typically, and I filled out a lot of con conservatorship forms in different states, is that typically a person does need to see a healthcare provider within 30 days of applying for a conservatorship. So again, if you went in, and it sounds like you have an appointment with an attorney, but if mm -hmm. you talk to someone at probate and say, my, my loved one refuses, this is part of the problem with their Huntington's disease, what do I do? Sometimes um, you can talk to a clerk who might say, let's fill out everything and apply um, and see you know, if we can um, serve papers to that person who who is going to be cons who is um, who you're applying an application in for to be conserved and see if we can get them to to come to court. They would have to. Um, there you know there they would be mandated at that point. So mm -hmm. that might be something again that you talk to the attorney about. I'm hoping that this is attorney who this is what they do. Um, yes. Sometimes it can yes. be a little costly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's something sometimes people don't go through an attorney, they just go to probate. But, you know, if you at least have an initial appointment, then it might be helpful then afterwards to reach out to HG Reach and say, OK, this is the information I got. And then can someone help guide me through this? That might be a good way to, to at least take that first step and then figure out, you know, two or three, like a flow chart after that. OK, that thank helpful? you. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And thanks for being on. It's, it's it's a difficult situation and it's not easy. <sighs> yes. you, yeah, I hear the sigh that mm -hmm. it's, you know, it really is going to be about taking care of yourself through all of the stressors right now. It's not easy. Um, but I think, you know, one of the messages hopefully will be that, you know, there might be a situation where it's going to have to get worse before it gets better, a fall, mm -hmm. a behavioral thing, something where you just have to say, I just need to do this. I need to pull the trigger here and just, you know, call 911 and just get to a situation where the person is, you know, in the emergency room a couple of times or known to the police um, and, and a paper trail is created. That might also help with some of the conservatorships down the road. So it's a lot of pieces. It's not A to, to Z. It's going through the whole alphabet sometimes. So hopefully. Right. Okay. And just start keeping a log of all those things. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it would be really helpful just to have like a file on your phone to say, this is when I called 911. This is what happened with this person. This is what was going on. Just so you have um, a, a paper trail that when it comes time to fill out all this paperwork, you have it right there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. No, we don't have too many people live right now, but if there is something, um, other questions that people have, I see Erica just uh, uh, logged on here as her, with her video. So what are the questions are people asking you? Hello, hello. First off, uh, just incredible presentation. I thought that was amazing, um, even for me to just sit here and listen and learn. Um, I did want to uh, kind of add that we also do have on our hdreach.org, we also have a caregiver safety plan and behavior logs. And we also have clinic logs that you can reach out to us and we can provide um, 
so that we can kind of be a part of part of your journey and helping you be safe, helping you have these conversations and everything that Dr. Hennig Trussman talked about um, today that we can kind of help you um, talk more about these things and hopefully get your loved one to a um, to a more safe state and um, help you all be supported the best that we can. Um, I do have a question. Um, I think for, I've, I've heard quite a bit that it's really hard to even just get somebody in the car to get somebody in the car, to even go to any type of appointment whatsoever. Um, how would you go about doing that? Like that simple, it sounds so simple, but yet it's, it's for some people I feel like is so impossible. Yep. No, absolutely. Great question. And I think it really is just going to be a question in terms of what their mood is going to be that day. Um, A lot of times before people go into a healthcare provider, they're not sleeping well that night before, as I mentioned, they're irritable. And even if they said that they would go, a lot of times they won't. So the first thing is you leave yourself plenty of time. So you don't just say 15 minutes and you get in the car and we'll be there in 10 minutes. You leave an hour in advance so that you, if you have to do some type of negotiating and it could be bribing, it could be whatever it is. I think that that's really helpful. Number two would be safety. You absolutely make sure that you are safe. If that person is refusing to get in the car or running away or, you know, um, you know, coming after you, that you just let it go. And like I said, if that person can stay home, you get into the car and go to the healthcare uh, to the appointment uh, yourself. And you just say, you know, this is what I'm dealing with. What what can I do? Very similar to, to you know, hoping that people will will have a discussion the way we just did tonight in terms of some resources and what the, what the person, the caregiver can do. Um, and know that this is also not linear. It might be that one day they get in the car and the next day they don't or the next time that they don't and the time after that they might. So it really can vary. And I don't want to give people a false impression that you know, a lot of times people will just say, if they can just go to the clinic and I say, you know, hold on, because the expectation is that, you know, we're the Holy grail and we are not. Um, It's just that first part of saying, okay, I want to at least have a rapport. One of the really nice things, and I know COVID really sucked, but a silver lining is that a lot of times now we can do a video visit so we can come into a person's home. Um, Please do know that a lot of times in terms of treating symptoms with medication, we do need to still get that person into the clinic, especially this quasi post COVID time. We do need to a lot of times do hands on to make sure that um, a a prescriber, uh, someone who's prescribing medication can see that person and do an assessment before medications are are provided, a prescription is provided. But, you know, it might be that just, you know, get the person in the car that one time and they go and then they decide because of all these other things that you told on me or, you know, I'm mad at you for, you know, taking me there, that at least we have that one time that we saw the person, we can do video uh, appointments. So do talk to your local providers and say, do you offer that? There's a woman that I'm working with here in Virginia who has agoraphobia. She's not able to get into the car. I really need her to come into the clinic. But the first thing I'm going to do is to try to at least set up a rapport with her. And she's willing to talk to me on the phone, but then it's going to be a video chat. So she becomes a little bit more used to me and, you know, she'll see my face and she'll say, okay, now I have, you know, a name and a face um, and, and, you know, trying to brainstorm with her ways that we might be able to get her into the car and, you know, can I meet her downstairs? So it is about a little bit about thinking outside the box. So do, you know, talk to your healthcare provider in your area to say, you know, what do I do in this situation? Leave yourself plenty of time. If that person refuses, do not force them into a car. It's never going to be a good situation. Um, Again, I think sometimes having somebody as a buffer can be really helpful. I did have a situation where I had um, a loved one who was the one, and she called herself, unfortunately, the punching bag. The person was not physically... um, abusive to her, but she felt like a punching bag. And what she would do is she would go to the clinic from work um, separately, and she would have somebody else drive this person that, oh, we're going to go to, you know, the drive through we're going to get you a, a milkshake, and then we're going to go to the clinic, and I'm going to be with you. And again, just having that buffer there without the loved one who might or might not trigger this person sometimes will work. Again, you know, once that person was in a public building, 
they weren't going to start lashing out. And, you know, we talk about, about treatment, you know, trying to get loved ones help. And I think it's really important, you know, especially ex trying to explain to family and ex extended family and friends why that person looks different when they're at home with you versus everyone else that they pull it together. A lot of times people or family members will say, well, they're just, you know, they're faking it or they're lying or you're, it's not as bad as you say. And a lot of times what happens is that person with HD is pulling it together so much in public or with that other person that that's not the reality. When they come home and that they, you know, let their hair down, all of a sudden they're lashing out again. We, we find this with people in those mid stages a lot who are um, working and will pull it together at work and then come home and at six o'clock crash till the next day that they're out or are verbally abusive to family members because they, they couldn't do that at work. It doesn't mean they're faking. It doesn't mean they're lying. It doesn't mean Huntington's comes and goes. It's that they're really trying to focus and pull it all together. So a lot of times what happens in a doctor's office, in a clinic, in a public uh, place is that they will pull it together and they will not let the true colors show. So that sometimes does happen. And if we take away that trigger, sometimes that will help. And I, I don't know, that's sort of a, a long, long answer to your short, really good question. No, that was, that was perfect. Cause we, it's, yeah, it can be, like I said, that can be like the first start of, it seems simple getting somebody in, but yep. HD is really so complex yep. that it really deserves such a complex answer. Yep. Really all of these deserve, you know, this, this slide, it, it really was needed to have these complex and um, multiple ways of having these conversations and um, caring for, our, for the loved ones yeah. um, and caring for yourselves as caregivers. Yep. And I think it's really important for people to keep in mind that if that person, you know, is really refusing treatment now, and if they have Huntington's disease, at some point, it is going to change. At some point, things are going to get worse, whether that is because of a fall and it's that slippery slope or just the progression, the natural progression of Huntington's disease, things are going to change. Um, and I work with so many people who are just so frustrated and, and their loved one, you know, they're just like, if they just did this, this would fall into place, everything would be okay, or took medicine or came into the clinic. And, you know, I try to give support to the caregivers, but I always say things are going to change. I've had people who are fixated on working, on driving, on whatever the situation is, and it always changes um, because it just, it, it's kind of things with Huntington's disease will progress. So, you know, do whatever you can now. Think about, you know, does, is it going to get worse before it gets better? Or if there is a crisis, even if you can pick that person up off the floor, maybe that's the time to call 911 and just say, no, 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 you got to stay there. We're, we're really concerned. And okay, you got up, but I'm going to call 911 because you hit your head. Um, and, you know, I'm going to give you some ice, but just again, to get that person known to the, um, provide the EMS, the, um, the police in the area, even if they discharge a the person right back home, you at least say, okay, this is what's going on. Um, you know, at least you have somebody that you can, you can start it, you can start a paper trail and, and at least see somebody. So those are the suggestions. And this is not an easy topic. And I want to let people know, again, a one hour presentation is not the end all be all. Um, our, you know, it's really, really hard to, to have a loved one who does not want to get um, help. Their anosognosia is really, really strong for a lot of people. So, you know, please do know that as caregivers, we really, as Erica said, need to make sure you're taking care of yourself. Reach out to us at HD Reach. Um, and, and hopefully we can walk you through some of these. And for other people who are going to see this on demand, uh, you know, you might not have a chance to ask questions right now, but we will always make sure that we are available um, to you to answer questions if, if those have not been answered right now. Bonnie, thank you so much for this presentation. You gave a wealth of information, so many tips. I know even the people that are watching it live right now are probably going to watch it again on demand because there's there's this is rich um, with with information. And as you you said perfectly, things are going to change. So some a situation that may not apply right now down the road that may come up, or you may know someone. Um, and so we we really do strongly encourage everybody to, you know, watch this on repeat, but also share it with other people that you know. It'll take us a few days, maybe a week to get it edited and up on our website. But as soon as we do, please go to our website under our educational conference materials, and you will see this webinar as well as a, a 
lot of other great content up there that answer a variety of questions about HD, because as everybody has said, this is not easy. It's complex, but there are multiple approaches and there are a lot of people who can help. So that's one of the, the main uh, messages that I think Bonnie shared tonight, that there are many people that can help you that are in your corner that can work with you. And we can help think up some different approaches if other strategies haven't worked in the past. And next month, we'll have another webinar. It'll be on December 8th, and we'll have a panel discussing how to cope with, with grief and the holiday time. Um, it can be a tough time. It can be a, a fun time, but we'll give you some strategies for ways to, to make it through the holidays and, and you know keep thriving. And so we encourage everybody to go onto our website right now, and you can sign up for that, that webinar um, right now, and we'll continue to give you reminders about it. But it will be taking place on December 8th at 7 p.m. And um, that's it. I just want to thank Bonnie again for being here, for being a part of the HD Reach team, for Erica being here and being a part of the HD Reach team, and mostly to everybody who is watching. To thank you for being there being here and to ask you to please take care of yourself and have a good night.